All right, let's get started. Y'all good? Okay, I'd like to make some introductions real quickly. Uh, Director John Cooper from ALDOT, Vince Calametti, uh, Calametti uh, District 9, um, Eddie Tyler, School Superintendent, John Wilson, CSFO, is that correct? Right. Frank Boatwright, Facilities Director, is that, can I call yes. you that? Been called worse? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank y'all for coming, guys. We really do appreciate you being here. Thank you, great crowd. Um, it's real appreciate. We're very appreciative to see these kind of people have interest. These numbers have interest in what we're going to try to do tonight, which is get you the information you need. I will go through the presentation as quickly as I can. Um, hopefully I can do it in 30, 40 minutes. And then that way it'll leave plenty of time for questions and discussion. I think that's more important for us to have time spent on what you want to know, what you want to talk about, as opposed to hearing me or any council pontificate. So all I ask is anyone's welcome to the microphone. Anyone's welcome to make any kind of comment, as long as it's constructive. Anybody's welcome to have a better idea than we have. We welcome that. But uh, please keep it nice, is all I ask. Um, there will be microphones around the room. Just raise your hand if you have a question. There's a number to text questions at the end if you want to text a question in because you don't care to go to the mic, or you can write it on a uh, index card. We have those as well. So if y'all would like, we'll get started. Talking about transportation improvements. First thing we're going to do is we're still working and hopefully going to have by 2020, the spring of 2020, the fifth lane on Canal Road to the Tom Thumb from the wharf. We have two phases. We have design phase and utility relocation. Then we have the paving. All that is lined up to get started in early 2018, but it is approved and ready to go. You see the, uh, I don't know if you can see the intersection here, but it's going to be a um, free-flowing southbound two-lane turn there in front of the Tom Thumb. Um, we will have an improvement at that intersection for a northbound lane, and then you'll see why in just a minute. That's what we're going to do right now. This is a future project that we're looking into. We call it a bypass. This is two free-flowing south east and southbound lanes into 161, which take, will take the traffic out of the intersection at 161 and Canal Road. This one here, I hope you can see it, is north and south free-flowing traffic, which will essentially make the orange part of the display somewhat of a town center and more of a local uh, destination. Highway 161 is fixing to be resurfaced end of this month, early into December, and hopefully completed by the end of December. Canal Road widening, we're going to go from 161, three lanes, hopefully all the way to Wilson Avenue, hopefully by 2020. This is the improvements that we're going to do from Canal Road down to the Art Center. You see a, a large roundabout there at the Art Center. What that will do is route everybody to the east that wants to go to docks and make a U-turn around the roundabout to get back to docks. That seems to be the, <laughs> the only reason people go right anymore. But the roundabout will allow us to restrict left turns along the front part or the most westerly part of that once uh, Canal Road area because what happens is when someone stops to make a left turn, you all, you all know this, it backs up into the intersection. So hopefully that's going to be eliminated. It will be a little bit inconvenient for some of the folks that live right there near docks as they will have to go to the red light at Canal Road 161 and make a U-turn if they want to go back to Bear Point. <coughs> but also at Callaway, we're going to look at making a possibility of a U-turn there as well for those that want to go back to the east. <clears throat> This is the new bridge. New bridge to the west is going to be at the south end of the new road that's coming off of the expressway. As you can see, 
The, nor the north side of the canal is going to be the marina district, a waterway district for Gulf Shores. They want to develop that. So you'll see ingress, egress, or the ability to get on that road and go north or south. It will be five-laned from the bridge back to the wharf. Anticipating completion 2020. It will be a free bridge. This is a close-up of the bridge. You can see the ability to uh, pretty much go east, west, north, or south. This is the Wolf Bay Bridge. We're serious about the Wolf Bay Bridge. We passed a 2% lodging tax increase. The reason we did that, and again, guys, y'all jump in where you think you need to add to it, but... Federal and state money for bridges is few and far between. We know that we've got to move traffic on this island. We know that we need to grow to the north to allow growth to happen over there to take some of the pressure off of the island south of the canal. The 2% tax made the most sense to us because there's a nexus between tourist and beach use and infrastructure demands. We didn't necessarily feel like a sales tax that would hit everybody up year round or a property tax increase made sense. We felt the nexus was with the beach. It will generate considerable money, up to five to six million dollars a year that will be spent on infrastructure. The bridge itself is anywhere from 40 to 60 million dollars. We will have to do improvements on the north side going through Mr. Lorenz and Mr. Barber's property. But we're planning on beginning preliminary design, conceptual design, and environmental right away. This is the layout of how it would connect uh, through Mr. Barber's property up to County Road 95. And County Road 95, you could north to 98, or you could go back west on 20 to the expressway. But it lands on Lorenz's original landing is yeah. still there on Lorenz's and yeah, right, right there is Lorenz's part that's property, right. and then all this and it crosses Mr. to the northeast. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, Sapling Point. Um, the goal will be that Mr. Barber and Mr. Lorenz will annex their property into Orange Beach, and that will be give us the ability to move north and uh, see some growth. Just an artist's rendering of how it would look here. You see docks are still intact, didn't go anywhere. <laughs> this is looking north. Now, the Foley Beach Express, we have been negotiating with them for some time. Um, this the bridge company. We just could not come to terms. Uh, not to say that they were right, wrong, or we were right or wrong. It just we just come to could not find a mutual agreement that we could both uh, sign on to. So, but they have expressed interest and they're going to, in, in improving services, so they're going to expand uh, the toll booth uh, to two, possibly three more lanes um, in 18. And then on the bridge, we're gonna have three lanes which we can reverse. So you'll have two north if we need it or two south depending on traffic. Powerline Road, we're in the process of acquiring Powerline Road right now. Uh, we will pave it, um, finish it out, so that it will create a loop into our sewer plant, into the 10 acres that we own next to the sewer plant, over to the ballparks, and through the school, or around the school. Hopefully 2019. This is the new phase two project on Beach Road. It's a continuation of the project they just finished, which is a, uh, a directed uh, turns or di directional turns. Uh, this will go from essentially light, what, what's the light number there to Walmart? Y'all remember? Anyway, you know where the U-turn is to the west of Walmart. It will pick up there and go down to Romar Beach um, access. There'll be two red lights for U-turns. We did talk to them about a few, they've been great about listening to our input or taking our input on how, 
what we have now is working and they've made several changes. We are going to look at loop road, at possibly a light there and a left turn to give a little bit easier um, egress, getting out of Walmart and Winn-Dixie and going back to 161. There are some reasons why they took that light out, but they are going to look at it and see if it's feasible to put it back in. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, gotcha. Okay. You make, that, make that comment. Go ahead. The, the other signal that you see in the center of the, of the photo is near Whitecaps Condominium, which gives more room traveling west when you pull out of any of the retail centers to actually get across the two lanes and into the left turn lane. So the temporary lights that you have today will go away. And it's only, I think, 800 feet further west. This is the new Orange Beach Middle School High School site. Um, we're very happy. Uh, we think it's going to be a great addition to our community, one of the best things that could happen to us, in our opinion. Uh, it's where the uh, wastewater plant was. Um, it's a lot of room. It's going to be built out. $15 million, 7th through 12th grade school. It's going to build be built for a capacity of 800 students with common areas up to 1,000. Um, hopefully, it will be open for business fall of 2019. And we're going to position the building such that with growth over time, we'll have room to build another building that should be able to separate high school and middle school when the time comes. A little uh, brief rundown of our revenues and expenses, our financials. Uh, you'll see in 2017, we're on track to do a little better than we did last year. Um, if you'll look, the blue is our revenues. The orange is our expenses. Hopefully you'll see that we've tried to keep expenses in line and where there's growth, of it, growth with expenses is generally relative to growth with revenues. There was a jump in 2016 that was due to several capital uh, purchases such as fire trucks and the uh, only footprints program that cost us about $1.5 million. Debt management last year, well in 2016 we paid off $10.5 million of debt. In two and a half years we will be totally debt free. And we built the art center and it's paid for. We have a double A-plus bond rating. Revenues are trending up. We have reserves of $43 million. Assessed property value of $907 million. To give you a little perspective, Gulf Shores property values is in the mid 500 million. We, the 900 million is just about more than all the rest of Baldwin County put together. You know we continue to fight and strive for a family-friendly focus, safe and clean community, and we're up to about 290 full staff, uh, full-time staff members. 2% lodgings tax, why do you have $43 million in the bank? Well, you see the Wolf Bay Bridge is 60. The evacuation parkway, which would be the road through the state park, would be 80 million. Beach renourishment is 20 million. If FEMA, for whatever reason, decides to quit funding beach renourishment, a part of that's going to fall on us. It won't be for the full 20, but we never know what we might be stuck with in having to fund the beach, or renourishment of the beach. Perdido Pass dredging is four to five million every three years. The Corps has said they will no longer dredge passes that are not um, port-oriented passes. We are considered a recreational pass, so we don't know what that means. So. It could fall on us or it could be cost sharing. We just don't know. Then we've got sewer upgrades to the north, six and a half million, two new fire stations, seven million, justice center expansion, three million, civic center, that, that's a long story, but five million, rec center expansion, six million, aquatic tennis, four million. And I think you see what all we got. City Marina, two million. The point is there's a lot of money to be spent in Orange Beach as we grow and Everyone in here probably has a pet project on here that you would support. 
And you ask, well, why does the others own there? And that's because somebody else wants them on there. But that is all the list of projects that has been expressed to us through the community that they want to see quality of life dollars through our taxes that we raise go toward. What's on the horizon? We're building sidewalks everywhere we can. Drainage improvements, we're constantly fighting to deal with a uh, very low level grade and uh, it's very tough, but Kit has done a wonderful job with our drainage projects. Uh, the whole department over there is really, I mean, the drainage on this island has improved drastically in the last 10 years. We're working hard to improve your health care options. Uh, we want to do much better with what is closer and is something, I think something that's all near and dear to our heart is we want a true health care option within 15 minutes. Improved education options, citywide public safety improvements, tech investments, all that is money going toward keeping you safe and protected. Fiber to the neighborhoods, utility upgrades, capacity improvements, and historical preservation. Some of the investments, we uh, completed the Alabama Point East Park, the Art Center. We bought a new fire truck, new fire boat. Sportsplex, completely renovating the Sportsplex. New parking lot at the Coastal Arts Center and citywide sidewalk uh, expansion. This is the sidewalk that will go from the end of Oak Ridge over to the ballpark. Uh, we are currently putting sidewalks in on the length of Oak Ridge. This will be a trail around Snapper Lake over near the ballpark. Uh, this is the new sidewalk on 161 on the public side, Publix side, that will go from uh, the trailhead, I think, down to Publix. That's underway. So, questions? 747-4386, 747-4386, or please raise your hand for a card, or if you just want to ask the question outright, tell somebody to bring your microphone. Where are the microphones at, guys? Raise your hand so you know where they're at. So, Mayor, um, we might want to invite these folks stand and let them know that there are some seats on both these wings. Y'all want to turn open. the lights back up? We have lots of seats down here to the side if y'all want up to come to down, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's either chicken back there or they're Baptist. <laughs> All right, we have a microphone in the center, so please, come on. Hey, Tony, can I ask a question first? You can. On the U-turns out on Beach Highway, are we doing anything to be able to help, for example, a snowbird pulling a fifth wheel making a U-turn? Because right now it's almost impossible when you turn out of Walmart and you go to the temporary U-turn light to be able to make a wide U-turn, especially with the pedestrian. If there's a pedestrian walking, you U-turn right into the pedestrian lane, and it's just a concern, and I've had many citizens ask me about that specific U-turn. I just wanted to see where we we're going to address that. I think the size of the U-turn was limited by right-of-way, and I, all I can say is in today's world, when you're pulling a fifth wheel of that size, you probably have a, need a predetermined route. You need to know, but Vince, do you have any addition <coughs> or... Yes, there will be a larger U-turn in this new project that will accommodate that. The, the DCNR provided additional land at the Romar Beach access Great. to allow for a large bulb out that will also accommodate our fire truck. That was also a concern that we've had. Great. Thank Second you, point was on the property where the school is going to be built. I've had a lot of questions about the fact that it's called the old wastewater treatment plant. Um, <laughs> Just for an explanation, that was all concrete. The water was in concrete, and that concrete was completely removed. So, Well, yeah, let me expand on that, too. That was a, called a Class A type of facility, which meant it only handled, how do you say this with <laughs> grace? Clean poop? It only handled residential waste. 
<laughs> there was no industrial waste of any type, which would include heavy metals, any type of hazardous waste or toxins. Um, a lot of the waste byproduct we sold as fertilizer, a lot of it went to craft farms. So the point being is there's really, there's nothing there that would create a toxic or hazardous waste site or issue. ADEM monitored that on a monthly and quarterly basis, and ADEM does not mess around. Uh, the effluent or the discharge we have in the canal now out of our wastewater plant is as good as the water out of your tap. Um, so there will be a phase one um, environmental study done of the property by the school system that will just to reinforce what we're saying, but I don't think we would have any issues whatsoever with any type of toxicity on that site. But like you said, all of the concrete, all of the plant has been removed uh, in, in its entirety. Anything else? No. Okay. All right, questions? Does somebody, there's somebody over here. Mayor. Mayor. Okay, Just please go to the microphone. If you got one, go to the microphone. Somebody over here. Where's the microphone on this side? I, right here, Mayor. I got one question right oh, here Oh, okay, I'm sorry. All right, please. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Cooper or Mr. Calmetti. As you know, I live down the one right by the park. They've closed this Highway 2. It goes through the park. And, you know, we've always used it with the trailers all came into the parking lot. And now on our road that comes through the park, they put this safety guard, the fence down it, which is very good, very committable. But there have been accidents on that road. When that happens, it's going to be a long way around for people to come into the new convention center. And the convention center is going to bring a lot of people through that road. And as y'all know, it's very, very narrow there coming through the state park. And why did they close, or if y'all have anything to do with state property, or why did y'all close uh, Highway 2? County Road 2. I, I mean, do you have anything to do with the park, the roads in the park? No. That, that well, you would... Y'all don't coordinate traffic that, you know, that really affects the city, and it's going to affect the communities, our convention center and all, when you only got one road coming through there that instead of everybody going down through Gulf Shores and then coming back to the convention center. It, it's... Uh... Yes, and I understand your concern, but unfortunately, ALDOT doesn't have anything to do with the state park road system. That was done by Robert Bentley, Cooper Shattuck, and the group that built and designed the... Well, it, it, without it, any input from anyone or consulting. Well, it is a bad... It's going to be a bad situation. For there have been actions there, and when it does, it's going to really bring up the traffic. Okay, thank you, Pat. <clears throat> um, Mayor, would that be Chris Blankenship? It may be Chris Blankenship now. It was not Chris Blankenship then. But he's asking it's, questions, what is going to happen now because of that. Could we maybe refer them to Chris Blankenship? Uh, you can, but uh, Chris Blankenship is the new Department of uh, Conservation. I don't know where that will go, but you're welcome to call it. There was a, the, the DCNR was not really involved. That was a very specific group formed to create that entity. And... Um, I don't know that the Department of Conservation has any real say-so in that roadway right now. But Chris Blankenship is who you would call if you want to at least maybe follow down to, to find a trail to go to. Mr. Belinsky. Thank you, Mayor. My name is Neil Belitsky, and I'm with the Beach Express Bridge Company. Uh, American Roads has operated the toll bridge for the past 10 years. We have and we'll continue to work with Orange Beach, ALDOT, the business community, and the residents. We are committed to addressing the big picture and the overall transportation problem. Having said that, we're puzzled by the insistence that another bridge be rushed through and built if the problem is already being addressed by the addition of new bridge lane and other measures like video to tolling that are already underway. That's five and a half million dollars worth of work that we're putting in at no taxpayer expense. For you, you that don't know it, video tolling removes the need to, for cars to stop. That in itself is huge. ALDOT had asked us to work with the legislature, and uh, we were able to uh, work with the, again, work with the legislature and introduce and have the governor sign video tolling legislation that'll benefit the entire state of Alabama. 
Our recent plaza expansion has already addressed much of the problems with the backups heading north. So the question that has to be asked is why spend $30 million if the problem is currently being addressed? Given scarce and limited tax dollars at the very least, why don't we give the new lanes and other measures a chance with proper evaluation and study? The improvements we're making will triple the capacity of the Beach Express Bridge and dramatically accelerate the flow of traffic. More importantly is another equation that few people have been uh, made aware of, that when the bridge was built, we agreed and we will continue to honor our commitment to build another bridge once traffic volumes reach agreed upon level. We can tell you firsthand from letting traffic flow freely during the summer that the bridge is not necessarily the problem. As has been talked about here, it's the road system south of the bridge, including Canal Road, and it's those <laughs> problems where the $30 million of tax dollars should be spent. By late December, we will reevaluate re our Beach Express Go program to put lower tolls in place through the end of the year. Our tolls support the maintenance improvements to the bridge, and again, at no cost to taxpayers. We also pay Orange Beach a fee for every vehicle that goes over the bridge, and Orange Beach receives a total of about $1 million a year that will be put in jeopardy if this other bridge is built. We will continue with our initiatives and have, plan to have all the work on our bridge completed by May of this year, and that will include 24-hour, seven-day express lanes one of the frustrations for Orange Beach residents has been getting to the express lanes. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Does anybody wish to address it, or do you want me to address it? Or does it need addressing? Mayor, we, we have a question over here right, in the center. Gentleman in the back. Uh, hi, I'm uh, John Jefferson. Uh, live and have lived at uh, Summer House for 25 years. Since Ivan, the road in front of Summer House becomes a lake uh, where traffic has to be patrolled uh, by city police and the center lane becomes a driving lane, the turn lane becomes a driving lane. Will this phase two raise that dip in the road where the water accumulates and eliminate the flooding. Kid, have you got any answer from our perspective, city perspective, as to what might help it with future development? I don't believe, and uh, Mr. Calametti can confirm, I don't believe at this time there's any plan to raise the paving in front of Summer House. I do know that Jay Palmer, the maintenance engineer for Baldwin County, is con constantly and consistently looking for ways to improve drainage in these specific areas. He's been doing a lot of grading in the shoulder. He is uh, increasing the amount of pervious area, increasing the amount of storage in the shoulder. The problem is, is there's no place to take the water. You can't take it to the beach, and there's no place to actually take the water. So um, he is continually uh, attempting to address the drainage issues. I don't think that's something that's completed, uh, but at this time, I don't believe there is any proposal to raise the paving. But if you raise the paving, you're still gonna push the water somewhere else. Yes. The problem is there's just nowhere to push the water. It's bermed up on the south side. We don't want runoff onto businesses on the north side. It's just really a very difficult situation that I don't know if there's a, a fix. Do, do you guys have any insight into a fix, Vince? I mean... Uh, well, one thing we have looked at is a lot of the condo associations have landscaping that's through the years has come out onto the right-of-way, and we think and it has helped in the various locations that we tried that we recapture the right of way for what it was originally planned for, which was drainage. Uh, there is very little drainage uh, on the island. I think Kit, as the mayor said, Kit has done a great job trying to facilitate it. Um, the best thing we can do is to re recapture that area, bring it back to sand, and then let the, uh, the rain, the rainwater, the runoff just perk through the sand. The, the good thing is, 
Uh, we only have standing water generally for a short period of time because it's sandy soil. And we only really get standing water when we have these high intensity storm events, which aren't often, if we get a slow rain event, then we don't have that problem. The other thing is whenever a project comes in on the beach, the city of Orange Beach requests that the developer take the water out of the right of way and provide a stormwater management facility to accommodate that water. So with more development, it gets better. But you know, it, it, it's, it's just a difficult problem on the beach road because of the lack of an outfall. Thank you. The, the center lane or turn lane is a driving lane during the rain. If you build a center island uh, in that turn lane, there will be no place for that water to go and it will be channeled and people will need pontoons to be able to navigate their highway. Yes. Yeah, uh, my name is Frank Lehman. Uh, I live in Beaver Creek. Uh, I've been listening to what you're talking about on sidewalks, and uh, you know, I, I notice things like that. You're you're going to have an additional sidewalk on the on on the additional side of 161, but I don't see any sign of any sidewalks going from the wharf down towards down towards Beaver Creek, and uh, that doesn't seem to be in the plans. When is at least one sidewalk going to be planned for that area when you're putting in two sidewalks some other places? Not anytime soon. Well, so why not? One, one is very expensive, if impossible, to go down Canal Road because of drainage and the five lane widening. There's not going to be right away enough in, a, in both places. Secondly, we try to build the sidewalks where they serve the greatest number of people to get the greatest bang for buck. A uh, sidewalk from the wharf to the west to just Beaver Creek that's right it, now. That's what, as far as the developments are, yes. Yes, uh, so I understand. But, but the, the bottom line is we can build sidewalks in other places where there are a lot more of the greater population and density as opposed to building down to Beaver Creek. But So it's twofold. It's the cost and drainage, those two go hand in hand, and then the fact that it's just a density issue. We have other places we need to build. Is that fair? No, I don't think it's very fair because I don't see where there's all this population density along Route 161 where you're putting in a second sidewalk when you already, already have one on the other side of the road. Well, I, and we'll just have to disagree. But, but I mean, there is one already on the other side of the road. Now you're going to put one on on the second well, side of the that's road. Because of the, it, that is because of the amount of use with the park and the trails and the difficulty crossing back and forth. Coming out of the trails, going back down to Publix, back to the trails, just makes perfect sense as opposed to having to cross the road. So, And it was a fair cost for the return. Again, everything we do, we look at cost and return. And Right now, we're putting our money where there's the biggest bang, the greatest density, the greatest, greatest, uh, the greatest use. Going from the wharf to the west is not the greatest use. If anything, we would go from the wharf to the east to connect with 161. But we're not even going to look at that because it's a multi-million dollar project and it's going to be very difficult to control drainage if we widen the five lanes and then put in a five or six foot wide sidewalk. It's just very difficult. So Canal Road is, the Canal Road sidewalk is sort of off the, uh, off the table right now. It, it looks to me like, well, we're kind of getting ignored because we're the people way, way down to the end towards Gulf Shores. You are. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tony, is there any chance uh, rem of... Remember the drainage. I mean, I don't mean that ugly, Frank. I mean, it's just, that's just the money's got to go where the money goes. I mean, you know. <laughs> but we so. did invest in Beaver Creek and drainage issues. Exactly. So how much did we spend in Beaver Creek out of our, the kindness of our hearts, Frank? We <laughs> did what, Kit? Ah, <laughs> uh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Tony, is there any chance of coming out of the back of Beaver Creek and joining the state, the backcountry trail? at least to give them some access? Uh, we can look at it. We can. Yeah. Why don't you all buy it, and then we'll build the back trail you for you right through there. But let's, let's be clear, though. How much we spent a ton of money in Beaver Creek correcting problems that were not necessarily City of Orange Beach's problems. Okay. 
Okay, just give us a little bit of credit where credit's due. Okay, we good, Frank. <laughs> Mr. Scott? Yes, Scott Hardy, 24509, Guff Bay Road. Tony, I just want to let you know, I live on Guff Bay Road, and you guys have done an awesome job with our road and the canal. It is really pretty, and our neighbors, some of them are here. We want to thank you for that. Uh, I've been a resident of Orange Beach for about 15 years, a former banker, and I'd like to say, you guys, job well done on our debt, that we'll be debt-free in, what, two, two and a half years, and you paid over $10 million as a former banker. I want to let you know I think that is awesome. And I'm really, uh, and I certainly appreciate Mr. Cooper and Mr. Tyler being here, and we're excited about the school system and, and with the state. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Scott. Scott. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Mayor Beckham Center, Al, we got a couple questions right here. Yes. I agree with all of that, and it's been a very for, infor, informational meeting so far. I just have one question. My name is Sarah DeLazer, and I live at Sea Chase on the beach. Boulevard, and I'm also the property manager there. I just wanted to know what the plans are for the medians. Are they going to be landscaped in the near future? <laughs> We've had, I think, quite a few cars get stuck on those. <laughs> Trucks even, I mean, I see them. They come out of the Walmart and they're just stranded there. And um, you know, Do they have plans for that? Some kind of grasses, some kind of yes, small trees? We have big plans, but we have run into several roadblocks, no pun intended, with um, fish and wildlife, some other issues with the beach mouse and type of habitat that we're allowed to put in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we're trying our best to get a new landscape. This, uh, Aldot has been great. Uh, they've been great to work with us. We're trying really hard to look at how do we now um, reset, but we're working on it. Uh, we would love to have already had it done by now. But unfortunately, we, we got a little bit sidetracked with Fish and Wildlife, which is a federal right. agency. Do we have a timeline, Kit? Do you have a timeline? That's what I'd like to know. Just, just stand at that mic if you want. <laughs> just stay there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's currently in review at ALDOT. Uh, once we get the approval from ALDOT, because we resubmitted, we had a number of different issues. Plus, we were talking about putting trees in, which we're no longer going to do because of the, we don't want to reduce the speed limit. But it's in uh, ALDOT review. We should be hearing back from them soon. And then we will prepare bid documents and bid it, right. and hopefully within the next month or two. And I'll expand on it because a lot of people have asked about this. If we want trees in the median, we have to reduce the speed limit to 35. We got snowbirds that drive faster than 35. So, and I mean that in a good way, not being ugly, but the point being is, do we want to go to 35 with trees or do we want to stay at 45 and no trees? So we've been trying to str struggle with that decision. We want to, we've got to irrigate it. How much do we want to irrigate? Because Water Authority water is not inexpensive. Um, and then the upkeep, we have to uh, landscape it and keep it up. How much do we want our people in the middle of a five lane road landscaping in the summer? So there's, it's not as easy as just going out there and landscaping it. We're, we're trying to be smart about how we do it from a, an upkeep and expense side, beautification side, and a safety side. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Another one, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Got a simple question, just a simple man. Uh, moved down here a year or so ago from Birmingham. I'm on the board of directors of the subdivision Windward Lakes, back behind Walmart in that area, Fairfield Inn. It's an obstacle course to get out on the road now. You can't go left. Uh, you gotta be real careful when you go right. Then you gotta make a U-turn to get on out of there. I'm all for economical development, but when do you say enough is enough? I mean, uh, I, Orange Beach is a hidden secret. What do you it's mean? A, I, you clarify what you mean by enough's enough. Well, when do you say, you know, we've got enough high-rise condos that that's all we need? I know that e any economic developer is going to be tickled to death to have all that, but he don't live here and have to drive in it. I'm, so well, that's, that's what I'm talking about. And again, I, I never want to be ugly, but I've been dealing with this type of question for 20 years. State law requires that anybody that owns property is absolutely allowed to develop their property to the fullest extent of the zoning of that property. You can't deny somebody the right to develop because we don't want them here. 
Whether I agree or disagree with growth is irrelevant. If there is a development that is zone condo, we can't say no. They have the right to develop. If we say no, we will get sued. We will lose millions of dollars. It goes for residential properties, just like you live there. And I can tell you this, and I hope you take this the right way. You came here last year. Well, the year before that, a lot of folks didn't you want you here. So the, <laughs> sure you're okay. right. so the point I'm making is we're doing everything we can do to manage growth. We have, we have taken a strong stand that we're not going to rezone residential properties into high density properties and we have not done that. We are not going to compromise residential subdivisions uh, for the sake of development or growth. We've tried every way we can again to manage growth in the best possible way but acknowledging people have a right to develop and build. I understand that. You've been to Destin, Florida lately? Yes sir. It's one way in, one way out just like here. Do you want to be like Destin? I, I, again, I don't understand your point. I just gave you the reason why we have. So I, I don't know what you, I guess what I'm asking you to do is tell us how to fix it. I mean, you, you, you've, you've identified a problem. So now I guess what I'm asking you is how do we, what is your solution? I'll work on it. Okay. I appreciate that. <laughs> and I mean that in the, I mean, just being frank. But I'll expand upon that to anybody that wishes to discuss that point because it is a strong topic of conversation about growth, how much is enough. But again, I don't know. If you don't sit in a planning commission meeting, if you don't sit in on council meetings, it's hard for you to understand or know exactly what growth is and why we have growth and why we have to approve. Y'all feel free to jump in, guys. No, I just, I just <laughs> want to make a comment before we move on to some of the other. We're in a city of what they say 5,000, but probably more like eight to 10,000. How many cities in America could you go to for a town hall meeting and see this? I'm just sitting here looking out over the room. We've got what, close to maybe 1,000 people in this room, and I'm looking at business owners, I'm looking at realtors, and I'm just looking at the input, restauranteurs, of, of everyone that comes in here. We just did budget, and one of the things we were talking about in budget is how blessed we are as a city to be making decisions with the budget we have and to be good stewards with it. I just want to say I'm proud to be here. We're a special city. We do have some issues with growth. We fight them every day. But when you look around this room that every fireman has to be a paramedic, what we've done with our police department, all the improvements that we're getting with the new school, with Dot being in the room with us, I'm just grateful to be here, and I just want to say thank you all for caring enough about your city to show up and be here. So. A, a quick, uh, just a quick soliloquy on condo development. Uh, Brett Robinson came to us, had a piece of property zone condo. They worked with us ask us what did we want. The building that could be built on that site by right, which means if they met all, check the boxes off, we had to vote yes, was 900,000 square feet. What we ended up with was right at 500,000 square feet. Yes, it is a condo. Yes, it is 25, 26 stories tall, but it is half the condo that could have been built on that site. We asked them to downsize, they felt that was a good size for their company. And I think we got the best possible product we could get for another condo on the beach. And we try to do that in every single situation that comes our way. But there are, the, there are condos that are coming. There's probably six or seven in the pipeline on the beach right now that will be massive. But the properties are massive and they have the right because it was on condo way back when. So I'm glad you all are here to hear that because a lot of times there's a lot of miscommunication out there about when they hear you hear about a new development or a new condo coming. So Mayor on, who's next? Mayor on the other on the other side of it though, you mentioned it and I want to make sure that we that we really think about this this council and mayor have have never upzoned for anybody. If it's zone residential, we have we have we have voted to keep it residential. 
There's been at least five instances over the last five years where outside developers came in, wanted to either do an RV park or bring in a, a, a uh, business and put it right on the water. Um, and the residents that were there said, no, we don't want it. It's, it does not conducive with our residential area. And we agreed. One project we went through, I think, four different times to make the developer change it in order to get what the residents wanted. And it's going to work. So, it, it, you know, it come, when it comes to, to, to growth, there's going to be some, yes. We live in a, a we're, we're right in the square uh, between the, the, the target as far as where people want to come, and that is, that's very good. There's a lot of things that go on very good that people love to come here and live or either come and love to visit. But if you come and, you, and you've got a residential property, but you, and, and, and there's property on both sides of you or in front of you across the street, but if it's residential, this council and this mayor is going to protect that zoning. But if it's already zoned for a, for a multifamily condo and that developer has bought that property under that zoning, there is no legal way this city can stop that. The city can join in like Tony just mentioned and say, would you consider building this type of a condo instead of what, what you could build? And that's what you're going to see. You're going to see a different style that will be going up. So it, 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 the council and the mayor have to stay engaged along with the planning commission. The planning commission does a tremendous job of helping try to develop Orange Beach the way that we're wanting it to be developed. And so I just want to say, you know, it's, uh, it has always been our mantra. It's something that is not really a real uh, 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 thing that we, that we think about a whole lot. If someone has an issue that's in residential zoned area and they have a problem with the development, this council and mayor has stood 100% and has never upzoned an area. And we will continue to do that. That is, that's one of the easy things to do because it protects your way of living and, and what you live with every day. It is home. And that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to keep it. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay, please. Y'all, y'all. Okay, you, then you. Is there anybody else in the queue? In the queue? Okay, a whole bunch. All right, have we got written questions too? Oh, wow. Okay, that's, that's good. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, one question I wanted to ask, as you know, I live here at the wharf, I'm still your right. Is there any, when y'all redo or work Canal Road, is there any plan to put our traffic light back out where we can get in and out without having to merge? Traffic light at, at the main Wharf. street entrance. We did have three lights on the property at one time, and now we have none. I mean, we yeah. have the one, but we still have to merge into Canal Road yeah. traffic. Cecilia, you, you, I know you don't want to hear this, but <laughs> the traffic that you, your flow of traffic is the least amount of traffic. And you sacrifice for the greater good, so we'll we'll give you some type of citizens award for that. But the point being that, is, that's not going to save my life for anybody else. Uh, that's the problem, especially what, in the summer. I know because you've got the traffic in the right lane that's not supposed to be there. They're merging. Mm -hmm. Then you've got us coming out of the wharf trying to merge from the left lane, and nobody in the center lane right. wants to let anybody in. Here's what's going to happen though. Because I was there. You almost ran over me last summer, and I remember. So the point is, but you have a very legitimate concern because right now with the single lane, everybody's merging to the center. Yeah. But when we get the, the lane all the way to 161, that right lane won't be merging. Secondly, volumes of traffic will double, so you'll have much greater gaps between the traffic to give you the opportunity to merge it's when we got the two lanes to the west, all of a sudden it was much easier to get out and get across because we could move so much more traffic at one time that we had big gaps. Now, there are certain times, like Saturday morning on checkout, that it's really compacted. But when we get that other lane to the east, I really do think you're going to see the ability to merge much easier. But if we didn't do what we did, 
My gosh, we would have a nightmare with that single lane eastbound traffic. We'd never move traffic with another phase at that signal. But, but, you, but it's going to get better. But you know, we have all the traffic coming from here, from the convention center. Like this, I mean, there's hardly a weekend that goes by that we don't have something going on at the war. Right. This weekend, you got all of that. You have all the concerts. We have a lot of traffic. You're having to put police out there just to manage right. the traffic. We do. And it just seems that, you know, we've had all the lights work great when we bought here, and now all the lights are gone. Right. And I understand. So that's just a real concern. And another thing, talk about the landscaping on the beach road. When we went to the meeting where y'all presented how that was going to look, okay, now you're saying it can't be done. I don't think they should present pictures that shows this beautiful landscaping on the beach road and this beautiful median, and now they say they can't do it. It's trees. Trees, we can't. Yeah, it's just trees. Hopefully it's still going to be beautiful. But, you know, the trees, I mean, we can still do trees. We just got to go to 35 miles an hour. But they didn't say that or well, nothing was indicated no, when we went to the meeting. Yeah. Well, ALDOT had always said there was a possibility of a restriction in speed, and they told us that. Uh, we didn't think they'd, we thought they'd give us a break. And yeah. not, not, but we were wrong. So, but the point being is, that's where we're at with it right now. Yeah. But I do think we're still going to try to do the nicest job like we do with everything. We want to try to do it first class. Yeah. But uh, One other question, and I know you've got a lot more. But you were talking about the sidewalks along from here down Canal Road. Mm -hmm. You know you know all the development. We've already got the campgrounds over here. That's getting ready to be more developments behind here. You've got the wharf. You've got Cypress Village. You're going to have the school. And you're talking about the number of people. We definitely need some sidewalks, especially if you're going to put the school over there. Right. It's not a matter of whether we need it. It's a matter of what number, number one, the cost, and can we drain water if we build a sidewalk? And right now, it creates a tremendous barrier because we only have so much right away. And it will essentially form a dike to some degree and we would have to see, the, okay, can we punch through that dike at specific strategic places and move water? And it's just, it's just a difficult, we, we would be taking a great chance to do it and then see that we couldn't move water like we should. So in our opinion, we've decided moving water and getting the five lanes is number one priority. If after all that is done and we can piece together some sidewalk uh, additions on that north and south side, then we're going to look at it. It's not that we're saying it's completely ruled out. Yeah. It's just not in the plan right now until we get the road done and look at our drainage. Okay. Thank you. But it is absolutely a, a density-specific uh, project that, that merits uh, consideration. She does bring up a point that we could consider boardwalk-style sidewalks like they did in the park if we had to over the drainage ditches or well, we'll look at it, but it still is where do you put them? You know, how many do you need? I mean, a drainage engineer can look at it, but y'all know how it is with a 29-inch rain versus a 19-inch rain, 9-inch rain, a 4-inch rain in two hours. I mean, there's so many variables there. When it's that flat and it's that low, it's so hard to know what you're going to deal with when, it, when the, with the types of rains we've been having. So, but it is warranted that we look at it. Yes? Yes, sir. Uh, Mayor. Between the boat ramp and right aid on the beach boulevard, yes, sir. where it becomes four lanes there, and the bike path is in the middle, that's going to be a lawsuit <laughs> waiting to happen. <laughs> you address that. It is our, it's our comedic relief. So <laughs> I've yet to see a biker in it. I don't know. Has anybody seen a biker in it? Really? No. <laughs> I call it the ghost lane because I have yet to see one in it. So, but I don't know about y'all, but I'm telling you, when I'm merging, I'm not looking for a biker. I, I hate to be ugly, but I'm, there's too many things going on. You're just not looking. But I thought it was an anomaly, and I actually saw another one somewhere just like it uh, this past weekend up in Birmingham somewhere, I guess. Y'all know of any other bike lanes like that, guys? I think that's a federal program. Yeah, that, yeah that is. Is a, that's the federal because guideline. I've seen it in Florida. Mayor, if you're not watching for a biker, you better be careful because you're responsible. The, the bikes have the through way. Now, I know that's a serious concern, but bicycles on 182 have always been a concern for us. 
Uh, we, we ensured that this meets all the design standards and uh, we caution the bikers and the drivers to be very cautious. But as they are now, they meet federal guidelines. They have the signs that say, uh, I just lost it, but bikers uh, in path or something. But it meets design standards, so, uh, but it's a, very, it's a very cautious situation. I don't think anybody gets sued because it meets federal guidelines. It's a dictate, is it a dictate from the federal government because it's federal dollars? Maybe, it, maybe to add to that a little bit, like the mayor, I, and I agree with you, I find it counterintuitive. And several people have brought it to my attention and on several occasions I've asked to have it reviewed. It is the way it is laid out in the federal standard. I was in Texas a few weeks ago and saw one exactly like it there. Same U-turn formation, everything coming back to a busy intersection. The one thing I would say to you, I have had a chance to think about it a lot and it's worried me quite a bit because a lot of people have asked about it. But as concerned as we all are with that biker being in the center of all that traffic, Think if you sort of hid the biker on the shoulder, where most of us intuitively would put that lane. When you get up there to right aid and all that traffic starts turning right, a biker would have to be really attentive uh, to not follow that light and believe he had the right of way on the outside and the driver might not see the, the biker nearly as well as actually he sees the driver where he is. There is a lady in my church who has caused me to start being late because she challenges me on that every Sunday morning. <laughs> she has a place over the bridge. And so, sir, I want you to know that we have taken that question very seriously. We, we do not intend to make light of it, and we have not ignored it. But it is clearly in compliance with the design standard in what is called the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the MUTCD, that we're required to follow. So in answer to your question, who would get sued, uh, I'm living proof that you can be sued at any time for anything. <laughs> I'm the most sued official in state government. And I don't mean to make light of that. But uh, any of us could be sued as to whether we can be sued for having failed to comply with the appropriate design standard, I do not believe we could. We've checked that several times. I appreciate your question. It's been a question with me I looked at it just this afternoon as I drove it again. The lady in my church even challenged me on the width of the bike lane and whether that's adequate. And she hadn't ridden a bike in 40 years. <laughs> but it's concerning her and uh, she's beaten me. She now waits late for me at the back door. <laughs> so I'm gonna go back to church on time. But I didn't mean to make light of it, but I want to assure you we've considered that question a bunch of times and we've researched it, it was researched before it went in the design, but we've had occasion for folks like you asking us questions numerous times since it went in. And I've looked at it myself every time I'm down here and, and I still think it's counterintuitive, but apparently people who know more than me set that design standard and that's what we have to comply with. And I wasn't making light about looking, it's just, just giving you a fair warning, if you're in that middle lane, I'm not gonna see you if you're trying to juggle between cars and moving from the left lane to the right lane, or the, I'm just saying, it's a, it, so what you're saying is essentially the lesser of evils, right? Yeah, so it's just a dangerous situation, period. If, if y'all don't mind, I'm gonna take your question, then we're gonna move to some of the written questions that are specific about the school system, because I don't think we've hit many of those at all, so we need to hit a bunch of those. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Loretta Scruggs. Um, my concern is, besides the bike lane, which you answered that question, the left U-turns on the Perdita Beach Boulevard, when you have cars coming in both directions that are in the center lanes trying to each turn left, you cannot see around them and the blinking lights rarely turn green. So you have a backup of traffic in both directions 
because nobody can cut across because you can't see the oncoming traffic. And that seems to be a, a big concern and there's a lot of issues out there. And if we're gonna do that all the way through our city, you know, I'm not sure if we can get those lights to click on so that we can turn those left lanes with a, with a light versus just trying to pray that we're jumping out without on, on to oncoming traffic. The second issue I have, I'm just gonna, I do have an answer to the problem. Coming out of the public shopping center onto the Beach Boulevard there by the CVS, there is still a left arrow painted on the ground. Um, I have seen people that do not live in our area, our visitors, that get in that left lane and they have jumped the curb and gotten stuck. Um, spray over that left turn lane and that should take care of that. Thank you. That's a quick fix. So, you want to take the other? Yeah, we have looked uh, again at that um, loop road, and um, the the sight distance was marginal, and that's why we have we've done a temporary fix to see how that uh, works. We've taken everyone up to that one turnaround rather than the than the both. Uh, that seems to have worked good. We are looking at uh, during high peak travel times, rather than the flashing light, the flashing yellow, just to have it the red and the green, and then go to flashing on off uh, peak times to facilitate that left turn movement when, when there's not much traffic. So we appreciate your comment, thank you. Okay, Mr. Tyler, you wanna take some of the school questions? Yes, sir. Okay. I'll press that right there. Well, one I'll get to is how many positions overall expected at the new Orange Beach schools to include administrators, teachers, et cetera. A lot, all of that, I have our HR director here, Jennifer Sinclair, but all of that uh, deals with the size of the school based on units that we get from the State Department of Education based on you know the number of students we have. We have foundation units that are assigned uh, administration, we get X number of administrators per uh, school or student, we get counselors, but anything above a certain number that is provided by the state, then that usually has to be done locally by local dollars, and we look very close at that to make sure that if, if a school has a need, we're going to give it to them, but we look very closely at numbers. So we won't really know until we start the process of of moving personnel, and that is a negotiated process uh, with the city of Gulf Shores. Uh, you know, we have AEA here, uh, um, uh, Nicole King, she works with AEA and, and, and employees of the school system. All of this is negotiated. You know, we, we might want some things, and the city of Gulf Shores school system might say, no, we don't want that. So it's going to be a back and forth. We're looking for a smooth transition. So. You know, but it's not always just from our perspective. We have to sit down and listen to what they have to say. Another question was, what about the <laughs> students going to Gulf Shores schools that live in Orange Beach? Will they stay in Gulf Shores and move to the new school? Again, we might have a desire, but the city of Gulf Shores school system might have a different position. Right now, we're of the opinion that, of course, we're going to have to do some rezoning. If you live within the city limits of Gulf Shores, that is your school district. Anything outside those city limits, such as Fort Morgan or any of those other areas, uh, we don't know what's going to happen to Fort Morgan if they if Gulf Shores does not city school doesn't want them in in the city system, or they have to pay a money to go to the city system. They might prefer to be in the Orange Beach schools, which we'll run a bus, we'll pick them up, they can drive to school. So right now. Of course, it's said that in 2018 that they're going to start the system, but that's kind of not in their wheelhouse. It's, it's a negotiated position, and the state has to get involved, and ultimately the state superintendent of education, whoever he or she is, will make that final determination. So right now, if, you're, if you attend Gulf Shores High School and you live within the city limits, that's where you go. If you live outside the city limits, all those things will be negotiated uh, when, whenever, we, whenever they get a school board, whenever they get a superintendent. I'm going to add to that. I think 
don't think Robert Kraft would have a problem with me saying this, but he did make the statement, I believe, in a council meeting, in a public meeting, that he had every intention of the Orange Beach kids being taken care of by the Gulf Shore school system. Uh, if you're in the high school, you get to complete high school there. So uh, I think that they're going to work hard to make sure. I, I can't imagine those guys not allowing our kids to finish, and I think they're on record that they will. And I am putting Correct. words in his and, mouth. And, so. and, and really, that's not going to be any opposition on our part. Exactly. I mean, yeah. You got another one? Uh, yes, more school? we had a question about the interest of the school. It's very preliminary right now. We're still working with the architects in the city to see. We know we'll have visitor parking in the front, but what we have established is we're looking at doing the uh, bus entrance on the west side. It'll come in and it'll drop off on the west side. As far as the uh, car line, it'll go also on the west side, but go uh, south, then it'll turn to the east and come back on the east side of the school to have a separate drop off there. The issue, there's been <clears throat> considerable questions about traffic. Well, first off, there's no way our traffic is going to be as bad as the traffic you got right now trying to get into three schools on a two-lane road. So we will have, have as many officers in the road directing traffic and making it sc school traffic will take priority over everything else. If there's an event at the ballpark, if there's anything else going on, then we will ask them to schedule after school is uh, – uh, takes in or gets out. We'll work around that. School will take absolute priority as far as going in, going out. Uh, another question was security. Uh, we're going to look to secure these schools just like we fortify the elementary school. Uh, we do everything we can do to make it a fortress. And I mean that in the most pragmatic but uh, realistic way. And uh, whatever that takes to do, that's what I think we'll do. I think secondly, this council and I have committed that we are blessed enough with revenues, we will subsidize what we need to subsidize to maintain the highest standards of academic excellence in our schools, whatever it takes. Okay. Got any more? Another? Yeah, any other school questions? Okay. Does anybody, have you got anybody? There's a lady up front had a question. Okay, go ahead and get – we got a bunch of questions. we probably got 15 I, questions up here, guys. I, so. I think, Mayor, one of the things I want to say is that if your question is so specific and does not get asked, we'll pass that to them. And then if you have a question afterwards, you just need to let us know how we can get you in touch with them or them in touch with you. Some of these are way too specific for this audience. Okay. Mine's not very specific. It's pretty easy. We live in Cypress Village here right next door. We have uh, built more on the – I guess it's considered the west side of Orange Beach, now considered the forgotten side. Um, no, here, you're uh, east of the bridge. No, you're not forgotten. <laughs> well, it seems that way now with, I guess, the sidewalks and everything. Anyway, my question is in regards to, of course, traffic. Right now it takes us an average of 30 minutes alone when it barely starts getting busy to get down to the Beach Boulevard. Um, I would like to give my money to this city as far as shopping and uh, the rec center. We use that on an annual basis with my daughter that plays tennis. But it's currently taking me 30 minutes right now before. What we need is a light, more lights in regards to the Cypress Village. Uh, so far, most of our people are getting pulled over already by the cops because we're trying to shoot down the center lane, probably more than eight cars to try and get into our homes so we're not waiting about 45 minutes to get home from Gulf Shores picking up our children uh, for after school. So we were just, uh, as far as Cypress Village, with uh, now we're starting to do an electrical work on, and what are they going to do to improve for us to be able to get out? Nothing. Uh, there's more lights does nothing but compound the problem. The problem will rectify itself to some degree when we get an eastbound lane, like I said, that'll move a greater volume of traffic and give you a much greater gap between. But you're living on a five-lane highway. It's always going to be difficult in the high, high traffic times. But the more we try to create ingress, egress, ease, all we do is back it up worse. And believe me, we've studied these numbers, lights, we've looked at everything a thousand times. And we, in my humble opinion, have it, along with the state, have it down to about as efficient as you can possibly make what we have right now 
Like I said, relative to all the ingress, egress from the side roads and the volume of traffic that always comes in spurts, I, I think we move it pretty good. But I don't think a light there is even a possibility. And um, Move it all. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, we've got what we've got until we get the other lane. We, you know, I, I drive it probably more than anybody in here. And no, it, you don't. Not okay. unless you live. Okay. Well, we'll just have to agree to disagree. But I don't know that you want a light, Louder Lane wants a light, Money Bayou wants a light. We would have 15 lights down Canal Road. A lot of frontage roads they can go down to a light. Unfortunately, we don't even have a frontage road to be able, or a back way maybe right. to get to the wharf to use their light. And neither, is a, neither does the ladder line. Around to a light. Right. I'm happy to do that. I don't mind driving a mile yeah. to a light, but I don't yeah. even have that opportunity. Instead, I have an opportunity to turn on and sit yeah. inside of the middle of the median, putting my child and myself or my husband in danger. Mm -hmm because we cannot get out okay. of our homes, let alone an emergency situation or a fire truck needing to get into our right. neighborhood. Okay. Mayor, one thing on the Cypress Village staff has been working and continues to work on the north side for sidewalk connectivity. So yeah. that is something we're trying to figure out back. But, the, and then one of the questions is, would there ever be a, an overpass to the new school from that general traffic light? And that's an unknown. So. All those will come in time as we see the design, where the roads go in and out, and, uh, and from a standpoint of moving without a vehicle. And I don't mean to be short with you, but it's just hard to have a fluffy answer for no. I mean, we, we've just looked at everything we possibly can, but Cypress Village is deserving of a light, so is Louder Lane. Guff Bay Road is deserving of a less of a cycle than what they've got. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And if you go in and you put a light at every side, we, we could not move traffic. So, um, I, again, I just, there's just no answer to make up other than no. And, and I'm, you say that you promote for residential areas, but yet you just made our entire community now worth less money because nobody's going to want to purchase a home, including the whole brand new section being built, because nobody's going to want to attend with traffic. Yeah, well, you just got a brand new school across the street, so you're probably going to go up in value. Half our areas yeah. or the school, half our areas again, so that doesn't help us. Okay. So if we had it to do over again, we would have access roads on both sides all the way down. I believe everyone would love that. We've even looked at putting them from Lauder Place down to Blaylocks if we could get the owners to do it. Cross Island Parkway, just so the people in this room know, there was a lawsuit with the state. Um, on the convention center. And part of settlement of that lawsuit by the state was to have new, no new roads built through the state park for 20 years. Knowing we were in the middle and we've been working for years trying to get across Island Parkway. But Mr. Cecil, back to your question, that highway two, according to that lawsuit, can be expanded. So I would assume that somewhere down the line, somebody's considering expanding that possibly but just to your point, so just look at it from our point of view. We came in as council members to a PUD that had been approved prior, Cypress Village. Those, everyone who's building a home in Cypress Village wants to be part of the economic development and they have a right to build there. We can't tell them not to build. It's a risk-reward ratio for the builder that wants to build there, whether he thinks he can sell that home with what's there. I mean, it is an everyday, I mean, right now, you can drive and it's a five, 10 minute run. I drove it three times today. So, uh, but during the summer, it's a nightmare for all of us. Everyone in this room, we all fuss. We all fuss on Facebook. You can sit in traffic and read other people fussing about it. We, we've been working for years trying to get this extra lane. When this council took over, we've been trying to get that extra lane for years and years. Thanks to ALDOT and relationships being built with ALDOT, we now have two lanes turning on 161. We have two lanes coming this way. It's helped tremendously. We're working on that extra lane. But, you know, back in Tony up, if we put red lights, you've noticed we took red lights out because we had to because it was stalling the traffic so bad it wasn't flowing. So I wish we could sit here and say we'd love to help you, but it's part of that expansion of what we're dealing with. You're sort of one of those situations we we're, we're in a lose-lose however we try to help you. It's not because we don't want to. It's because we can't. 
A dedicated turn in or turn out? A turn lane into our neighborhood coming off of the toll bridge. Well, well you're talking to the right man yeah, sitting right me, over there to let ask. Let me just interject because I've been speaking to uh, Mr. Calamity's staff. At this time, we really can't do anything because we have a project that's getting ready to be built. And after that project is built and ha after you have greater capacity, that's the time when we start looking at we need to remove some driveways that connect Commercial Avenue to Canal Road. We need to start looking at Excel and decel lanes. There may even be an opportunity when we have capacity, because you can't put lights up when you don't have capacity. But if we do have capacity, you can put in signals that all talk to each other so that the lights are all in sync. But you can't do that until the road is widened and you have a traffic count and you know exactly what you're dealing with after the road's been built. So there may be an opportunity. It's just right. it can't happen now. And, that's what, and I go back to what I was telling Ms. Cecilia. Once we get the fifth lane and we're moving more volume, it's going to create breaks. But... But until then, it's just almost impossible to come up. Now, whether I thought there is a, is there not a, there's a center lane in front of your entrance, is it not? They blocked it. Who blocks it? It takes me at 45 minutes to get from the other side of the wharf, literally, to Cypress Village to get in there. And the other day, I was approximately 12 cars ahead, and for the first time in my life, I was pulled over. I have a clean driving record, and I was pulled over by an officer that pulled me because I traveled too far in the center lane. Because unfortunately, I can't exactly count how many cars are before you verge to the did left get, side to turn. Did he give you a ticket? Uh, nobody gave me a very nasty warning. Well, that's good. It's better than a ticket. I mean, come on. You know, we can't win now. I mean, you, goodness gracious. At some point, you know, that's how, that's how head-ons happen is people traveling down the center lane. My biggest complaint is people traveling down the right-hand line and going all the way to the light and merging at the last minute. And you know what? 99% of them are local folks. So, you know, so if we start giving tickets, then it's going to be the locals. Well, I'm a local. Why are you giving me a ticket? So, again, we, we continue to be set up in situations where I feel like we... We have a hard time winning that, but we can look at how to make a left turn lane. I don't know that that's not something we can't look at because there's not a left turn lane going. There's no reason for a left turn lane going west, is it? Where'd Kit go? Kit, I told you to stay at the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, can we look at that and see if that's even a possibility to make a recommendation? Yeah, I think you're talking about a D-cell lane, too, Yeah. Uh, and, a, and, and a specific center designated left turn lane. All right. We well, also looked at how do we take that frontage road on that side all the way down. And we, we've looked at that over and over again, and we would like to do that, but there's a private property involved. But we think that would be a cure for Captain's Cove. It would be a cure for a lot of people on that side to be able, if they had to, travel all. And what we thought, we'd take out all the ingress, egress, cut throughs, make that a road all the way to a light. And that way you could travel to a light and make your left turn. And we've looked at that. But then we run into drainage issues because now we're adding another road on that side. So, again, I never want to be ugly, and I don't want you to think we're not, we're not empathizing and sympathizing, but I, I think we've looked at every possible option, and we're just at a dead end right now. But we will look at the left-hand turn lane. Is that fair enough? You guys good with that? I don't know where you're going to find another lane to give them a left-hand turn lane. I live on the beach road. I live in a planned unit development right down the street from the Floribama. I have exactly the same problems that you have. Everyone has the same problems because we only have three roads to travel on. We're trying to do the best we can to improve, get more lanes, get more flow around and behind. But we all have that problem in Orange Beach, and we are working so hard to come up with solutions. Okay. Hello, Mr. Mayor. I'm David Lee. You'll be pleased to know this is not a road question. <laughs> uh, Mr. Tyler, thank you so much for coming down. We appreciate you visiting us, and I want to thank you for the commitment that the county is making to uh, our local school system here. Uh, my question really is that 
the, uh, I guess it's fall of 2019 is going to come pretty quickly. And so what is the planning process that's being put in place at this point to, and I know you're going to have to deal with the Gulf Shores issue. Um, I know there's going to be a separation agreement and those things you've got to negotiate, but we really only have about two years. So what's the planning process that's being put together um, so we have a fully staffed and functional school um, that we have all of our computer equipment and, and technology in place. Just what's the general process? Is there going to be perhaps a committee that's put together that is, or is the council specifically going to deal with a plan? Just how are we going to go back over, over the next two years to get to where we want to be in two years with the new school? No, sir. Uh, city council is not involved. Uh, this is a, a, a county school issue that is negotiated with the separation agreement. Uh, it goes back to what are you going to have in place as far as personnel, administrators, things of that nature. We won't really know until we get into the negotiations. They've got to get a school board first, then they've got to get a superintendent, and then the negotiations will start. Now, as far as is um, the personnel, like I say, that's negotiated, and we, you know, diploma tracks. Some people say, well, if you start the school, are you going to have physics? Are you going to have AP classes? Well, I have our dean of academics here, Joyce Woodburn, and when students start in the Orange Beach schools in the high school, they'll start on their diploma track. Uh, when you're in the middle school, you develop that diploma track. So when you enter the ninth grade, so it's not like Alberta where we're starting with the ninth grade this year, then next year we'll add a ninth and tenth then on up the line, we're starting a full-blown, you know, uh, 9 through 12. So we'll be providing the needs based on those students' diploma tracks. So we really won't know until we get into the split agreement. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have in a minute, we'll have a principal, uh, might have two principals, middle and high school, I don't know yet. We'll have several counselors. Uh, all of the academics questions come up. Will you, I mean, uh, athletic questions, will you have athletics? Uh, sure we will. When we start the high school, you'll have athletics, but it's really going to depend. I've got Marty McRae here who deals with our athletics. It really is going to depend on how long you want to be a JV-type program before you enter into championship play because you got to be careful how quick you jump into that deep end of the pool and, and – uh, because I've been there, so I understand all that. When all of a sudden you decide you're going to start playing uh, full-blown varsity sports, and you've got, you know, young people, or you don't have the numbers, you just got to be very careful. But so we're going to navigate that uh, as we go. So as far as all the pieces in place, we'll develop the plan as we get into our, our negotiations. We'll know more once that starts, and we'll have all the pieces in place. When you start the middle school seven through eight and nine through twelve. There won't be any voids. Everything will be in place that is provided in any of our, our other high schools and middle schools. Yes, sir. Christina. Good evening, Mayor, Council. I saw on the agenda tonight that you guys approved the another three years for the pre-K grant at Orange Beach Elementary School. I think many of the people here tonight do not understand the importance of what you guys approved tonight. That is actually a grant, and with your partnership with the county, we are able to utilize 75% of a grant money with your 25% support. So with that partnership, 18 to 20 children in our area get to have a pre-K education through a public school system because of the decisions that they make and the support that you guys have shown. And I really, really appreciate the commitment for an additional three years. As well as I know that there are many unknowns in the split that's occurring between Gulf Shores and Orange Beach. But I want to emphasize what you guys showed in the pre-K grant process and the partnership that you did is exactly what we need to see. I think being a voter in the county, I've showed up at the polls not only to see taxes get voted down countywide, but also to get defunded. So although we are looking at a brand new school, there are many things that are occurring. Pre-K, um, we added those but also to what can we do to help reading, re reading test scores, math test scores, and how we can help the children in this area. And your commitment with the funding is going to be critical because not only are we worried about the brick and mortar, but we're worried about the quality enrichment that occurs. And there are many things that are unknown, but I want to emphasize just how important it's going to be, especially as we continue to go to the polls and we're faced with very critical funding decisions in the future. 
just want to thank you for the commitment, and I also want to thank you for the commitment going forward because it's very critical. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Christine. Mayor, if I could, uh, on the pre-K issue, I was going to let uh, John Wilson, our CSFO, we don't want anybody to walk away from here thinking that, well, how come Baldwin County Schools doesn't fund pre-K in all of our elementary schools? And there is a reason there, so I'll let John kind of expand on that. Sure, and, and I'll just echo that. I, I think this is a, a perfect example of a, a great partnership between the county and the city in that um, our other pre-K programs are funded uh, through Title I funding um, and, 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 and through um, you know, uh, schools that, that meet that eligibility. And, and Orange Beach stepped up to the, to the plate and provided the, uh, the matching requirement in order for Orange Beach Elementary School to, uh, to apply and uh, be awarded with that pre-K grant. So it's a... Uh, it's a great example of uh, the county and the city working together for the betterment of the schools. So, um, quickly, we got more questions. Probably they've got time. Kids currently in the sixth grade. Can we keep them in Orange Beach next year so they don't have to go to Gulf Shores for one year? Is there any possibility? Stud oh. Students in in the sixth. Grade. They would have to go to seventh grade in Gulf Shores and then come back here for eighth grade. Are you talking about when the, when the school officially, when we get the facility built or when they decide to start no, the city school They're system? talking about the interim year, 18. 18. Right now, we would hope that everybody would stay in place uh, where they are uh, until we get our facility built. Yeah, I, I think what they're asking is, is there any way for a sixth grader this year to stay in Orange Beach next year in the seventh grade? I don't know how that would happen. Uh, uh, no, because we don't have seventh grade set up. Yeah. Uh, uh, any talk, and this is a good one here, any talk of a light at or bridge at the Florabama? <laughs> That's what All I All right. Oh, Lord, Please go. call John McInnes, and I'm going to give you his cell phone. Here we go. Me and John have had this talk now for two years about a crossover at the Florabama because I catch all the heck when it's backed up two miles toward the bridge. I do think the Florabama needs a crossover. I think it needs a cattle gate to put everybody at one point and put them <laughs> over. And I've told him that, and we've worked on that now. ALDOT is going to make some changes on the Alabama side to create a left turn lane into the Alabama side so that we don't have traffic backing up because of a left turn. Uh, we don't know what the Florida side is going to do, but I'll be quite honest with you until they get something to get Pedestrians over the road without car goes and a pedestrian goes car goes it drives me crazy But um, and I think everybody that goes that way knows what I'm talking about. So we've had that talk Totally up to the people at the Floribama. It is in Florida. We have a vested interest in it We do a lot for the Floribama and I told John if it's come up. I was gonna call him out. So Where's Cam? There he is. <laughs> this is not John McInnes. Cam, but it's is, mighty courageous of you to come on up here. I am proud of you. <laughs> this is his henchman. You the man, Cam. Hello, everybody. <laughs> My name is Cam Price. I'm one of the owners of the Floor Man, along with uh, John, Joe, and Pat. And um, it's a tough situation, and it's, it's tough for a lot of the people that live in Perdido Key and the people in Orange Beach who have to cross that area. Um, it's been tough for us. We lost a, an employee there um, last year. Uh, who was crossing at the crosswalk. So um, it's definitely a, a difficult situation. One of, if you, if you stand there and you watch the traffic, um, which I've done on many occasions um, from all different viewpoints, uh, you'll see that the majority of the problem uh, is the two lane road going into a single lane road and ha not having any center turn lanes. Um, we have worked uh, with both uh, Alabama DOT and Florida DOT. Um, we've gone through a lot of uh, different plans um, we are because we are in the middle uh, of the two states um, it's 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 not only working with Orange Beach Escambia County but also with uh, Florida and Alabama DOTs uh, we are continuing that process we're, we're continuing to refine plans we've had great support from uh, Alabama DOT um, we truly appreciate uh, your help um, they've been uh, a lot more receptive to making changes quicker uh, than Florida DOT has been and um, it's been a challenge to get everybody to work together. Um, we hope to have a final plan that everybody can agree on uh, submitted to Escambia County by the end of the year. Um, there's a, a permitting process that we've got to go through in Escambia County as well as working with uh, both DOTs. So 
Uh, we're working on it, and um, it's not a great situation. Uh, in the interim, we've done as much as we physically have the ability and legally have the ability to do. So we have the Scambia County Sheriff's deputies um, on full time uh, who actually manage the crosswalk. Um, and that is not to stop vehicular traffic, but actually to stop pedestrian traffic there. Um, so they, they hold the pedestrian traffic to allow uh, the vehicular traffic to go through the state line area. Um, we also have put up uh, signal boards on, on both Alabama and DOT, letting people know that there is a crosswalk um, due to the different um, challenges that pedestrians have had. Um, it's, not a, it's, it's, it's a tough uh, challenge, and th there is a lot of traffic going back and forth. Um, and we've done as much as we can. Um, the, the idea of an overpass, um, if you can imagine yourself uh, going uh, to and from the floor of Bama from parking lots on opposite sides of the street and being asked to walk up two flights of stairs to cross the road and then walk down two flights of stairs instead of using the crosswalk, it's a, it's a tough um, request and, and I think one that most of you guys would agree that most pedestrians are going to walk across the crosswalk. So. Uh, there is no easy solution. Uh, we're, we're very sensitive to the traffic uh, challenges that are there, and uh, we're working and doing everything that we can in conjunction with the different uh, federal and, um, or, or state and, and city and county agencies to try to come up with a great solution. And, and I can assure you that Tony has been adamant in his support uh, for us to, to make changes and, and try to improve things. I truly believe that when we get the new striping in, in both Alabama and Florida and we get the center turn lanes, uh, that's, that's about the best that we're probably going to get. Um, you may or may not know, but Escambia County um, at one point in time had been looking at four-laning uh, Perdido Beach Boulevard uh, or Perdido Key Drive in Florida. And um, that was uh, absolutely taken off the table and, and effectively uh, that plan was crushed by the county commission over there. So that is, so, so, so you will have two lanes going into a single lane of traffic um, moving from, moving west to east from Alabama into Florida. And uh, so it's a challenge that's, that's difficult and we're doing everything we can to address it. And we hope to um, have that um, fixed as quickly as we can. One of the challenges on the Florida side is they've got a multi-use path that's been approved in Perdido Key. Um, on the north side of Perdido Key Drive, and they are reticent to restripe all of the lanes um, from due to budgetary restraints over there. Uh, we'll pay for it. And, and <laughs> I mean, whatever it takes. Alabama DOT said they'd be happy to restripe it, but uh, <laughs> it, it's just it's just been um, a challenge to get them to move. And um, as of like six months ago, they said they wouldn't be able to do any of it until. Uh, 24 months down the road, we've worked with them um, to try to push that timeline up, and it looks like we're having some movement on it. So Thank that's you, the Cam. most information I have. Thanks, Cam. Appreciate you coming up there. Thank you, Thank Cam. You. Thank you, Cam. Will school sports have use of city sports flex first before outside tournaments? Uh, school will have absolutely priority over everything. When will we get the opinion back from the Attorney General about our school board representative, Ms. Swiger? Um, I, I don't know that's in the school board. I'm not going to put them on the spot to, com uh, to no. um, comment on that. Well, well, we have. I mean, it's public knowledge. We've asked for an attorney general opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, we filed that. Uh, the board 7-0 voted to file that. So I know we'll know something soon, and uh, some things just might take care of themselves. You know, we'll never know. But, uh, but Mayor, if I could real quick, I mean, I know that – I don't know how many other educational questions there are, but I do want to introduce the staff that I brought. Of course, I, I mentioned Nicole King with AEA, who serves all of our employees. We have a great partnership. I have Jennifer Sinclair, our HR director, Dr. Joyce Woodburn, our dean of academics, K-12. I have one of our board members here, Cecil Christianberry, who represents the Fairhope area and is very supportive. And we have Terry Wilhite, our director of communication and public relations. And we have Marty McRae, our secondary uh, assistant superintendent over secondary schools, athletics. We have Homer Kaufman, who is director of IT services. Of course, Frank Boatwright, who is our director of facilities and maintenance and does all our construction. And John Wilson here, our CSFO, who does a fantastic job of managing uh, our, our funds. Our budget was approved this year, $394 million budget for fiscal year 18. So uh, we, we've got a lot going on. Uh, 
that's a good question. Any other questions? Uh, if you if you have any academic questions, you might have be holding some questions, Mayor. I'm not sure. We'll get to, um, okay. we're going through them. And you did he did ask for an attorney general's opinion on the representative. He did not ask my opinion, but I'm gonna give it to you anyway. Uh, there is no logic whatsoever in a representative representing you that does not live in your district. Makes no sense. Uh, it makes no sense that someone would be applying for a position in a competing school system that's fixing to go into a negotiation with the county and try to maintain a position at the county level. That's illogical, again, and a conflict of interest. So I think most everybody in the city of Orange Beach believes we need a new representative, and I think most everybody on the Alberta side hate to speak for them, but the ones I've talked to feel the same way. So hopefully our representative will graciously step down and let us get another representative. Do what? I can't hear what she Oh, oh. I do, somebody asked, I do not know if she can be impeached. And, and I guess that's a legit.